Thank you both so much for this really powerful film. Um, I think it might be great to start in, th in hearing a bit about your working process. Um, I know the way that you collaborated with your subjects and um, your mode of production in general is very unique to the, t the two of you and the way you work. You can carry on, Eileen. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll do, I'll do a simultaneous <laughs> translation. <laughs> So if you could speak to that and also this idea of um, the ethnography of fiction, which is kind of the central idea that the two of you are working with. Yeah, um, so uh, we're going to do um, uh, this thing, I guess, in which uh, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'll start and sometimes Adirle will start, but I, I will translate and add to so that it goes a little faster and we're not. Um, so we, I think we 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 met about eight years ago and we found a way of working together coming from very distinct places, I think through this idea of ethnography, I, um, but a, a sideways approach to ethnography, if, if I can say that. Um, I, I come from a, a place, so I, I, I studied and I worked at a place called the Sensory Ethnography Lab, where um, we were very concerned with um, kind of like thinking through a way of uh, estranging reality using the camera. So, so how do you, when you go about filming something, what is this mediation that you put between yourself and what you're filming, what that adds to the relationship to the subjects or to the places that you're filming, and how to, I mean, this is gonna sound wildly pretentious, but uh, how to try to see it with a different eye, because, particularly because you're, you're filming it, you're not just looking at it, right? And so, um, I think that, Adirlai, when we met, he was uh, working through an idea of ethnography of fiction that he'll speak about. I'm not going to try to speak um, uh, for him, but um, I feel like I was the only, I, at the time in the in the Sensory Ethnography Lab, I was the only person who was not an anthropologist who was coming from cinema, and so I was also trying to understand how I could relate to this idea of ethnography as a process, uh, even if I didn't kind of like know what ethnography was or how to do it or cared even because it was not my discipline or what I what I was focusing on but I was very intrigued by this mode of production of like spending a lot of time in a place figuring out what you want to make as you make it um, and so in Adirle was also thinking through a similar process of kind of like creating a fiction but then only being interested in documenting the process of making that fiction to the point that the fiction dissolutes and it becomes about something else. Like if you film for 18 months, we may start with oil, an oil platform, but then what we're filming is, is daily life, is our quotidian. We film every day or almost every day. And, uh, but uh, you'll talk about the ethnography of fiction. Um, então, acho que basicamente assim, eu acho que assim, a coisa da etnografia da ficção tem a ver com também com a com a com a ideia de que um outro real é possível, né? Uma outra ideia de realidade é possível assim. So this idea of an ethnography of fiction has to also to do with um, believing that another reality is possible, that another real is possible. Porque eu acho que parte assim, da, da primeira ideia de negociação. Como que você vai negociar o filme? Como, como que vai chegar para aquelas pessoas que são atores não profissionais e vai começar a negociar esse filme? Porque o filme basicamente é feito com atores não profissionais. The f it's, it's, it always departs from a negotiation. So the first uh, moment in this idea of like thinking what real we're producing is how are you even going to negotiate the film you're making with the people you're making with it with because everyone in the film is a non-professional actor. Porque eu acho assim que as pessoas têm, eles têm, eles têm entre eles uma ideia muito clara do que é, do que seria uma representação. E a representação tem a ver com, que, com aquilo que eles assistem. A minha geração foi assim. A minha geração é uma geração de cinema que era sex crater, né? A gente assistia Bruce Lee e, e pornô, né? Então assim, a cinefilia é Bruce Lee e pornô. Então assim, tem muito a ver com o modo que a gente pensa 
a representação. Uhum. Uh, so the first moment of that negotiation is obviously uh, around or deals with uh, what kind of performance uh, we are constructing or what kind of performance we're asking for. Um, and that comes that, that um, requires us to play a lot with um, people's references. So there's only one a theater in town for this generation that was growing up in the 80s uh, and it, um, it only had one screening a day and it was Sex and Karate. So it showed a porn film and a Bruce Lee film. And so that is a kind of like the cinematographic reference uh, that the city has constructed, this place that only has one cinema. And so it, the first moment of kind of like negotiating this reality has to do with like what are the references for performance that people come with and uh, what can we also bring to that conversation. E aí eu acho que tem, tem é isso assim, né? Tem a ver com o modelo de produção. Quanto menor a equipe, o tempo de lata, eu acho que tem muito a ver com isso. A partir do momento que você filma aí esse tempo de lata, é, mesmo que você propõe uma ficção aos personagens, com esse tempo dilatado, a gente chega em outro lugar sempre. Então, assim, se fosse para resumir a etnografia da ficção, seria uma ideia muito, clara, muito, muito objetiva, assim, de propor personagens ficcionais e filmar esse personagem enquanto documentário, enquanto etnografia. Né? Então, assim, por mais que eles sejam, né, por mais que tenha essa ideia... Desculpa, Joana. Uhum. Uhum. Vai, 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 agora vai. <risos> por mais que a gente proponha uma ideia de ficção, uma ficção com, com os arquétipos da ficção, o tempo da filmagem é muito longo. A gente fica muito tempo em cena, a gente fica um, dois anos em cena. E esse um, dois anos em cena muda radicalmente a ideia do espaço, do tempo, da memória da cidade. Okay, I'm gonna try. Um, this has a lot to do with the production model, right? So we have a very, very small crew and we have a very extended space uh, for shooting. So we reduce the crew so that we can film for as long as we need to film. Um, and so what inev inevitably happens is that once you propose a fiction and you're filming in this like incredibly dilated time, that fiction kind of like um, uh, falls apart and what, what, what comes to the foreground is sort of like the making of the film we're making together or the day-to-day -day activity of making the film we're making together. So if I had to summarize what for me an ethnography of fiction could mean is that I propose uh, fictional characters uh, to the non-professional actors, but then I film everything um, as a documentary, or in this case, we film everything um, as a documentary, because uh, even if we, you know, even if, uh, even the wildest fiction, or even like the, even the, if we are very committed to this idea of creating a fiction together after one or two years of shooting together every day, the fiction ends up like really being what matters the less in um, what what becomes what comes to the foreground is the work uh, where the, the work of the daily shooting and daily creating the film. Eu, eu acho que tem uma coisa também que é assim. Essa realidade interessa a quem? A quem interessa esse jogo da realidade? A quem interessa a gente fazer um filme mostrando a tal realidade? A realidade para o povo periférico é sempre uma derrota. Uh -huh. É sempre a ideia da de derrota. Because if we depart from the question of like if if we were to film our reality, our daily lives, who are we filming it for? Um, we, we're coming from a periphery, we're making films in a periphery, right? And so our daily lives always, uh, if we feel, if we were to film it as a straightforward documentary, uh, it would always be we would be showing our defeat. Uh, so we'd be departing from the standpoint that we already lost um, and that needs to be put on display. So we don't want to do that, and that's where fiction comes in. E daí eu acho que a gente pode criar outra possibilidade de realidade, assim, eu acho que a realidade e a memória sempre é opressora. A memória sempre é opressora, porque a memória, ela cria uma espécie de amansamento, ela amansa o nosso pensamento em relação a as possibilidades de política e estética. So we then we use fiction to create a different uh, to create another reality because our memory is always oppressive to a certain extent and it's always appeasing, right? So when we put our memory on display in that way, there's always an, an appeasement, appeasing of the bodies, uh, and we're trying to f also kind of like Aí, work against that idea. Eu vou terminar. <laughs> vou terminar. It's gonna end now. <laughs> Mas assim, eu acho que a ideia da etnografia da ficção é muito simples. Você propõe arquétipos ficcionais leva os arquétipos até o limite, esse limite é filmado de forma etnográfica e sempre gera uma fabulação, sempre gera um espaço fabular. E o espaço fabular, para mim, é o único espaço político que existe. Um, ok. Um So the ethnography of fiction is very simple. Uh, we propose archetypes to um, the, the characters and then we shoot it as 
um, and so we propose archetypes and then we shoot it as an ethnography. We believe in the fiction we're making together and as we are shooting it, the, the people and uh, so the people we work with and ourselves, we start fabulating. And that, that fabulation or that collective invention or imagination is the only, is for me the only possible political space for the films we make. Will you say more specifically about how you first came to encounter um, Lea, Chitara, and Andrea? Um, so we, because of what Adelaide was saying earlier, that of the difficulty even to create a belief in an idea, in the possibility of making a film together in a place where there's no film theater or there's no idea of like going to watch a movie. Um, we we searched for around six months. She, Andrea comes from a previous film. So with her we knew we wanted to work. Um, but we had written this script that we never filmed because we never film any lines that we write, but we had written it so that we could search for actors, cast it, discuss it, get the film funded and everything. And in this film, uh, the archetype we had built for, uh, we had constructed for the character of Shitara was a woman who worked at a gas station who smoked a lot. And because she worked at a gas station and she was always, mm -hmm. you know, she would come home with gas in her body and she smoked so much, she was always on the verge of exploding or of catching on fire. She was always in that tension of, so we were, we basically, I think for during six months, we went to, well, a lot of gas stations, bakeries, bars, and we were searching for this person. And every time we would approach someone, their first question is like, oh, is this a porn film? And it would be like, no, it's not. Just come with us. We'll show you what we've done before. We can have a conversation. And then we would read the script together. And we, it, we never filmed the script, but the script would make clear what the film was, which was useful, you know, because it was like, a political film, it had this, it had that, it dealt with a certain idea, uh, and so we also wanted that expectation to be clear. Um, so we'd read it together, and then eventually we'd start working, which she thought it was super simple, because she came and she was just like, a, uh, well, I worked at a, gas, at a gas station, I know how to shoot a, a gun, and I smoke a lot, so let's do it. Um, so we, we kind of like also knew we had found her because of that, and, um, then Laia is, is as, as you see in the film. So she, uh, Andrea had been in jail, in prison with Laia, and Shitara is her sister. So they would talk about Laia all the time. Every day we shoot, they'd be like, Laia is two meters tall, and her hair is long like this. And she took seven, seven rubber bullets in prison, and she didn't fall down. So she became like a, a myth, and because we, we, we create setups, but we don't, I mean, we, we kind of like give prompts and create setups, but we don't, tell them what to say or or we we obviously work a lot and talk a lot. So there's a there's an imaginary that is being created, but they would like bring up Leia all the time. And I was the one, I think more than other Leia, I was really desperate. I was just like, this is gonna be the boor most boring film in the world. Because they're gonna be Leia this and Leia that and Leia was never gonna show up. So I was looking for a professional actor at some point and um, Shitara just sent us a text message saying my sister is out and two weeks, af two weeks later she was filming. And the first shot we shot with her, we decided to put it in the film, which is the shot when Shitara gets to Leia's house. Um, oh, sorry, when Leia gets to Shitara's house um, and she's by the window and it's really out of focus and it should, probably shouldn't have made it to the final cut, but we both loved it so much because I, I feel like that I, I had no idea how to film her. She was a she was an apparition for us, you know? And uh, we're all, like, there's a tension in that shot that we love because we're, everyone is, like, out of their element. Like, she's acting for the first time. She spent, she just came out of seven years in prison. She didn't, she didn't know what a cell phone was. She was, like, kind of, like, and now there's, like, a camera and a crew, and uh, it was a lot for her. She would, like, run away as soon as someone would say cut and we'd find her in the corner and have to bring her back. So it was just, like, it was a lot of, like, also finding each other, especially um, in the beginning of the film. But, but then she was so amazing that we ended up changing the entire film so she could take on one of the lead roles. And so filming in this way, which should diminish the crew and um, also gives us the ability of carrying, carrying on shooting as long as there's money, you know, as long as there's money left, we'll carry on. And so we can change the film uh, as we almost like we're reacting to the everyday. We're reacting to what's happening in the political campaigns. We're reacting to what's happening in the country, but we're also reacting to who comes, who, who are the people who start coming into the film and how that uh, completely like transforms what we're trying to do. 
Um, tu não entendeste nada, mas não sei se queres. I'm saying, do you understand what I'm saying, but if you want to add something. <laughs> queres acrescentar alguma coisa? É isso mesmo. <laughs> okay, so that's it. <laughs> Um, the oil is ours is a pre-existing political idea that in this film you kind of literalize. I wondered if you could talk about that. Uh -huh. that. Um, I was going to say that I eu falo muito rápido, só consigo pensar muito rápido. <laughs> então, só consigo pensar desorganizado, na verdade, assim. Hoje ainda pensar organizado, então. É. Eu acho que a ideia do petróleo tem muito a ver com o imaginário brasileiro de petróleo. Do, do imaginário... Porque o, o filme nasce dessa ideia. O filme nasce de um, a partir do momento de um golpe de Estado. No Brasil houve um golpe de Estado. Um, so, I, I speak really fast, and I can only think if I'm speaking really fast, but I'm, I'll try to be a little more um, organized right now. Um, so, this idea of the oil is ours um, is a slogan that exists, and it has to do uh, a lot with like the Brazilian political imaginary, to like reclaim historically the oil as being uh, nationalized uh, and for the country. Uh, What, what was happening at this time is that we're starting making this film after uh, a coup d'etat. Um, a coup d'etat, we said this? After, after there was a political coup in Brazil. Então, assim, é, existia, uma, existia uma promessa da política do, do petróleo. E a promessa era que 75% dos royalties brasileiros seriam investidos em educação, saúde, segurança e em todos os processos educacionais. So what that coup basically undermined was that uh, before uh, President Dilma got deposed and uh, the, the Temer government took over, that then became um, the Bolsonaro presidency um, after there was an election. Uh, what was happening before was that they had just passed a bill in which 75% of the royalties coming from oil Uh, would have to go through uh, to education, um, health, education, and culture, right? Education, health, and education, health, and culture. Um, and so this is going to be a complete revolution in Brazil because you were injecting millions and millions just in these th uh, three areas, and that had been passed as law. E seria de fato uma, uma espécie de nacionalização de um pensamento. A gente teria universidades públicas em todo em todo o país, como exemplo, assim, de ponta. Então, assim, teria to Desculpa. Uh, in that, uh, in that, sorry. Uh, in that law that uh, was then deposed when there was the coup was sort of like a, it was it was a nationalization of a way of thinking. We basically would start having public universities in every neighborhood, uh, in every city uh, of the country. So it was going to be a revolution for us. E, então, ao mesmo, e ao mesmo tempo tem uma diferença muito grande entre a ideia de que o petróleo é nosso e o petróleo é de nós. O petróleo é nosso é uma história clássica do Brasil dos anos 60, em que a elite brasileira progressista, paulista, carioca, sempre tomou de conta do imaginário do que o petróleo é nosso, do que seria o petróleo é nosso. O que a gente queria fazer, na verdade, é uma ideia do petróleo é de nós. Se o petróleo fosse popular mesmo, se, o, se a ideia do petróleo fosse popular, o petróleo era de nós. E nós ia fazer uma mudança. Então, era mais, basicamente isso. O que seria essas pessoas tendo acesso a esse poderio econômico? Então, era, era basicamente isso. E voltando para a ideia do Brasil, esse poder econômico, se cria uma ideia de corrupção. A corrupção é invenção, a invenção, a corrupção sempre existiu no Brasil. De, todos os governos tiveram corrupção. A ideia de corrupção nada mais é do que esse, esse, a entrada do grande capital no Brasil para desmobilizar uma política pública do Estado. Então a gente queria lidar com isso. Se o petróleo é de nós, a gente pode transformar a Ceilândia numa cidade independente, num país independente, e declarar guerra a essa merda de Brasil. Sabe? Uh, it really helps. It really helps that I that I made this film too, because otherwise this would have been <laughs> kind of impossible. Um, so there's two different slogans that that we're dealing with, and the second one is a little harder to translate. There's the "Oil is ours," which is a historical slogan from the 60s, um, which had. Sorry, not from the 60s, sorry, I got that wrong. It's like from, from the beginning of uh, when an idea of nationhood, of Brazilian uh, nation state was created, that slogan was present. And that slogan was kind of like, it's imaginary, was kind of, uh, was hijacked by the uh, progressive uh, elite, uh, progressive cultural and intellectual elites of Sao Paulo and Rio. Um, that took it, took it over and kind of like, um, sort of like dictated also the terms for its language. 
what the people in the film say, it's a, it's a little bit of a twist in the words. So they say the oil is ours, but ours is um, de nós instead of nós. So it's almost like a, a, a slang way of saying the oil is ours. And uh, that's a completely, um, th for us, that was a completely d different thing to say. It was, it was a popular idea. It was like, what would happen if uh, these people would have access to that economic power? What would be the rules then? Um, so if, there, if the coup implied a, a, dis a dismobilization of the idea of, our, of Brazil being able to kind of like create uh, its own cultural, political, geographic independence through these royalties that were feeding into the, ec the economy, um, then what we were trying to do is to kind of like declare Ceylandia an independent state that is at war with Brazil uh, through the slogan. Uh, one more question, we'll open it up. Um, the the scene in the evangelical church is very significant, and I think it might help to hear you tell us a bit about the, the kind of cultural um, specificity of that, especially um, in Ceylandia. Um, I, I mean, I think that I'll speak f for me when, when I was thinking about how to shoot that and why to shoot that. So um, there's, a, there's a, a small evangelical church in every corner in Solnashent, literally, I'm not exaggerating. It's like every street, every corner, there's one. And, um, and uh, every, all the actresses in the film are evangelical. Um, and so we knew that we wanted it to become part of the film. Um, but we also we are we're also very suspicious of how evangelicals have been portrayed in cinema, and especially, I guess, in Brazilian cinema, because that's what we end up discussing more. Because it's always a caricature, and it's always coming from like this kind of like arrogance of not even like kind of e even entering the church. You just stay at the door and you film everyone as if they're as if they're fools for believing in something like this. And um, at least I we knew that we wanted to try to do something else that we wanted that we that we wanted to engage with this community that has you know that it has all its faults as well but uh, but that at the same time you know like as here in New York we have we can go to a psychoanalyst or a psychiatrist you know uh, and it's not at the end of the day that's like you people are suffering a lot obviously life is really hard you're being humiliated in your job your son's in jail and you go there and you give your testimony and an entire community stops to listen to you and it's very hard not to be able to relate to this in a in a human way so we ended up spending a lot of time in these churches and uh, we knew that it was important to even if it was only through music and very little words and there was no pastor and there was no sorry not pastor i don't know what you call it um the person who preaches preacher i guess uh and there was and we, we wanted to get to this to what was important for them in that space in those like million small churches that everyone goes to every day um and Adele has more to say. Because <laughs> I, I guess, obviously, evangelicals now were determinant in last week's election and uh, why the polls were so wrong. So. Eu acho assim, eu acho que eu acho que a questão do evangelho no Brasil é, 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 a, é a chave do Brasil. A chave, do, a chave, você pensa, a chave política brasileira é o povo evangélico. E o povo periférico é evangélico. The, the political key in Brazil right now are, is the evangelical community, and the, the, periphery, uh, the pe people in the periphery are evangelicals. Essas pessoas, as, as pessoas que procuram a igreja evangélica, historicamente, são párias, assim. Elas não têm, você imagina assim, a pessoa não tem espaço nenhum em nenhum lugar. Ela ela está tá jogada, ela é um párea. O único lugar em que ela é reconhecida enquanto gente é na igreja evangélica. E a gente tem que fazer uma diferença, uma diferença muito grande do que é o povo evangélico e do que é a instituição evangélica. Uh, people in the periphery are often pariahs, right? They're not recognized everywhere. They're not, uh, you know, they're not given attention. And the only place where they get attention is in the, is in the evangelical church. And so, and it's also very important to make a distinction between the evangelical church as an institution and the people who frequent fre frequent the eu, evangelical church. I think the cinema Brazilian is extremely arrogant in relation to the evangelical. I think historically the cinema Brazilian was arrogant in relation to the evangelical. Porque não percebe justamente o poder que é 
Eu, eu, se a gente pensasse assim do que o evangélico, o povo evangélico é o que o, o povo do, da teoria da libertação foi para o Lula no começo da, da, da do, a criação do PT, também foi na base da igreja, que era uma coisa chamada teoria da libertação, que era a igreja cristã católica. Então, assim, historicamente, o cinema teve essa história, né, João? teve essa questão de, 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 um, de uma abordagem muito preconceituosa sobre o povo evangélico. So, uh, Brazilian cinema has always been very prejudiced and arrogant towards the evangelicals, and there's a also uh, uh, there's a misunderstanding because uh, um, even in the most progressive politics, so the foundation of the Workers' Party of PT, Partido dos Trabalhadores, which is Lula's party, um, at its creation there was something called theory of liberation, and there was a very a strong connection between that and Catholicism. So, um, the church has been involved in politics in Brazil both in terms of like the evangelical church and the right-wing politics, but even in left politics from the start, there was a very strong connection to religion. E acho que assim que o ritual evangélico, o ritual evangélico é como a gente faz cinema, é uma é uma fabulação, é, são os cantos, é, é a loucura, é o transe, o, o, é, a apropriação que o evangélico fez como exemplo das, das religiões afros tem isso também. Eles eles é o, é o canto que interessa. É a ideia do, do cantar, é a ideia de estar presente com aquele corpo, muito mais do que a ideia de ouvir um pastor assim. Assim, a mim me interessa muito assim. Eu, quando estou bêbado, então só uso música evangélica assim. Acho muito fora. So uh, the evangelical ritual is also very similar to the way uh, we make films or we make cinema. Um, there is, uh, there's been the, the evangelicals appropriated um, a lot from Afro, uh, the religions of Afro tradition. Um, so basically, it's a lot about like singing. It's a lot about trends. It's a lot of about being present with your body in a space. Um, and so Adriana was saying, I, I find it actually very beautiful and very moving. And when I'm drunk, I only listen to evangelical music. É, eu, eu, só para terminar assim, <risos> e o desrespeito, o desrespeito que tem, com, me parece isso, e esse desrespeito que tem com o povo evangélico é, é, vamos dizer assim, é um sintoma clássico do que o povo brasileiro também, de uma classe média progressista. Uma classe média progressista que se diz de esquerda, que se diz isso, aquilo, aquilo, outro, e tem, é como se odiasse a ideia do povo. Né? Eu, gosto muito da, eu gosto muito do conceito do povo, mas eu odeio gente, mais ou menos assim, né? gente de longe, o povo é muito massa, né? mais gente de longe. Eu acho que é uma ideia política, sim. Eu acho que o evangélico é a chave, neste momento no Brasil, é a chave. A gente está né, tá num momento crucial da política brasileira e que o evangélico é quem decide o que vai acontecer. Um... And so the, the disrespect towards the evangelicals is also a very revealing of a certain um, a middle and high class, a, prog a progressive middle and high class uh, from the big uh, from the big capitals, from the uh, big uh, centers in Brazil, who loves the idea of people but doesn't really like people. And so committing to evangelicals is, to a certain extent, also like a form of like political commitment. Eu termino mesmo. É engraçado que o evangélico é assim, as meninas todas são evangélicas do filme. Elas choram na igreja, rezam na igreja, quando elas saem, elas vão para o baile, bebe para caralho, fuma para caralho e pega todo mundo. Um, so everyone, all the all the actresses in the film are evangelicals, and it's um, there's also like all obviously this contradiction, right? Like they they go to the church, they they sing, they cry, and then they leave. They go to the bar, they get drunk, they sleep with everyone, and then the next day the cycle repeats. I love you, people good. <laughs> Let's open up to questions. Is there a mic Sorry. as well? Okay, there's one here. Assim, assim, Tiago. Sim, Tiago. Obrigado pela pela pergunta, Tiago. É, sim. Nesse filme especificamente, tem, é, sou eu e Joana. Né? Então, o filme é tanto meu como de Joana, a gente está sempre juntos fazendo o filme. E pensamos, inclusive, as músicas juntos assim. Eu acho que seria um bom assim, fazer filme, fazer canção para música. Pode ser uma saída, né? Que não vai ter mais filme mesmo. Então, a gente pode, a gente pode fazer filme para música, sim. So this film in specifically, um, there's now this is going to be weird, but there's two of us, and so um, we're writing together. But I think it's good. Like uh, I, I, we were not going to be able to make films anymore anyway. So maybe I should dedicate myself to writing political uh, slogans for songs. É, é, o Partido do Povo Preso como exemplo estava eu, Joana e André bebendo e fundamos o Partido do Povo Preso. For the uh, uh, 
party of the prison people. It was me, uh, me, him, and me and uh, Andrea. We were drinking and we decided to start a, a political party. Eu acho assim, cara. Eu, 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 meu sonho é fazer um partido político e ser dono do time de futebol. É só isso que eu quero na minha vida, sabe? Esse negócio de cinema é cansa às vezes, sabe? Mas fazer, assim, então, é, se eu pudesse sempre fazer, é, é, a minha ideia é sempre fazer um filme que, te, que crie um partido político, sempre. Uma ideia, assim, uma, uma obsessão, sabe? É, e aí, se der filme, não tem, se não der filme, não tem problema. Nunca, as, dar filme é muito difícil, né? Filme, é, você faz um em mil, né? Assim que presta, né? Mas o partido político pode acontecer. Um, so, my dream is basically, his dream is basically to uh, uh, start, uh, found, um, start a political party and own a soccer team. Adele was a professional soccer player before he started making films. Uh, and, so if the, and, the, and then, so he makes films for that to happen, and if the film happens, that's great. Because making a, a good film, that's like the really hard thing. Uh, and so, yeah. No próximo filme, tem um partido político também bancado pelo Estado, pelo dinheiro do Estado, sim. In the next film, there's also a political party that is um, bankrolled by the state. And now I'm being asked to talk about. Um, eu acho que eu falaria mais sobre a forma como a gente filmou a campanha. So I, I, I think that um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little about how we shot the campaign and what the what shooting in this way what founding a political party and shooting it as a real party in the city creates a memory and a performance of a memory that for us is important. People are always asking us like, oh, have the people from this place seen the film? But they were watching the film as it was happening all the time, right? And so the memory of the film is becomes kind of like ingrained in the daily life of the city because we work with non-professional actors. And sorry, sorry, Tiak, this is kind of like getting away from your question, but uh, just to add something. Uh, uh, because we film with one professional actors, it's really important that things are real, that there's nothing fake in the in the film to that extent. So our art director is an architect. If you press a button, something will happen and we live in that tension in every single set that, uh, you know, things are real and they provoke, the fire is real, where everyone needs to be very attentive and uh, careful all the time and that tension is really useful. But also for the party, we registered it as a real party um, and and when we went and we also filmed during the real political campaign Lula was in jail we had this idea that Lula could be our um, advertiser inside jail we sat down with Andrea we wrote the songs and we actually did the math we were like there's um, 20,000 16,000 uh, political um, uh, there's 16,000 people who are in a pre preventive jail I don't know what you call it they are waiting trial and when you're awaiting trial, your voting rights are not suspended. So if you could put an urn in every single prison in, uh, in, the, in Brasilia, in the federal district, and we convinced one family member to vote for Andrea, she would actually win the election. So we did, like we created a campaign, we put together a campaign, you know, 98% of it, of what we filmed is not, didn't make it to the final cut, but we worked with this idea, and so we went door to door, we campaigned, we proposed uh, the, the, the party of the prison people, sorry, it's different in Portuguese, um, to, to the city, uh, and that, that performance then becomes important too. Um, yeah. Não, assim, Tiago, eu acho que a performance, é mais, a performance é mais importante do que o próprio filme, eu acho. Porque você fica pensando assim, tu conhece lá, não existe uma sala de cinema numa cidade que tem 500 mil pessoas. Então, eu lembro que as pessoas, assim, as pessoas não viram um filme numa sala de cinema, esse filme. Mas eles lembram da performance, quatro anos depois. Que é muito mais louco, entende? Ah, passou um, um, uns doidos aqui um dia que existia um partido assim, assim, assado. Isso fica na memória das pessoas. Muito mais do que a ideia pretenciosa do cinema. Que o cinema pode educar, pode ser didático, pode ser... Cinema não pode ser isso. Cinema é uma desordem, na verdade, eu acho. Cinema só tem sentido na minha leitura se for um lugar de to total desordem. Assim. A ordem não serve para o cinema. Eu acho que o, o, isso parte do modelo de produção, parte do modelo de exibição e parte da, parte da postura que a gente tem em relação aos filmes. Isso é muito particular, como eu penso assim. Então, eu acho que esta performance era o que era interessante. Muito mais do que a, a, a edição do filme é aquela intervenção que a gente fez naquele dia, na véspera da eleição, na cidade da Michelle Bolsonaro, porque lá, lá é onde mora a Michelle Bolsonaro, a primeira dama. Ok. Uh, the, 
that performance then becomes even more uh, important than the film itself because um, instead of us kind of like getting stuck on a possible didacticism of cinema or a possible like, uh, you know, what people can learn then in this place from watching the film together or anything like that. What we are concerned about is like four years later, they still remember the day we went and we threw this party on this truck and everyone was dancing and that was also part of the political campaign in that place. Um, and I think that has a lot to do also with the production model that we we're trying to set up uh, and how disordered it is and what kind of like disorder we are trying to create um, in the city uh, and in the film or in cinema. So the, for, for him, or I guess for us, the, the order doesn't really uh, serve cinema or this kind of like cinema um, that uh, we are trying to do. It's the performative act and the, the, the sort of like the, the presence of the performative act that becomes important. It was the fact that like on the eve before the election, we were filming that and we were doing that in the same city where Michel Bolsonaro is from because uh, Bolsonaro's wife is from Solnacent. And so that becomes what sort of like we're after. There's so much more to talk about, but we're gonna have to end here. Thank you both so much for the film and for talking with us about it. Thank you, well, thank you for staying too, thank you.